Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, I want to welcome to a session three, uh, our afternoon session that is in our book entitled um, Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management, Identifying and Mitigating Threats to the IC. Uh, we have two other very excellent panels going on, and I'm very pleased that you've arrived, and I know many, I recognize many people in the audience, and as you can tell, we not only have an all-star panel, but apparently we have an all-star audience. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A. I know the panelists are too. I have a few brief announcements that INSA would like us to mention. If you have questions, please, they will be submitted via your question cards. Uh, fill them out as soon as you have a question. Don't wait to the end of the session to submit them. Pass them to the aisle. Uh, and the person on the aisle, raise your hand so the cards can be collected by the summit staff and they will be brought back in front of Larry and Larry then will pass them up to me. Uh, this session is eligible for continued education credits if you're interested in obtaining them. Please be sure to have your badge scanned at the end of the session by the summit staff in the back of the room and an email will be sent out to those scanned after the summit is over. Uh, for our panelists, Media may be present during the breakout sessions, and as I always say, the goal is to make sure that you four are promotable. So I would want you to know that everything you say is also going to be recorded and taped at the back of the room for the inside. Um, after the session, please join us in the exhibition hall outside the Potomac Ballroom uh, for a networking and exhibiting break. Um, also, I want to thank the INSA team, which always has been extraordinarily helpful, from Larry to Jacqueline to uh, Bob, who I think he's sitting here. Um, it, ENSA always puts on a great show, and we want to thank you guys for the, what you do for your public service. So we're going to get right to it. Um, I think if you have in your program the panelists and who they are, uh, we're going to start with um, Katie. And she's going to, I think, lay out uh, the, the, the table for us. OK. <laughs> yeah. And you want me to keep it to five minutes? That would be nice, exactly. What right. we're going to do is five to six minutes. I'll lean over and sort of you know, cut you off. We have a kill switch for the mic. And I think what's going to be nice about this session is to have the more interaction, because I think the panelists are really interested in what you all think about the supply chain question, given how hot it is inside our current system. All right, so those of you who have heard me speak know five minutes is almost an impossibility, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, my name is Katie Arrington. I am the CISO for acquisition, um, for uh, OSD acquisition. So the chief information security officer who has been tasked to figure out Scrum, supply chain risk management, and cybersecurity. Um, I'm the one who has led the CMMC. Anybody in the audience know what the CMMC is? Raise your hand. All right, those of you who don't, um, we have taken, and I will say Harvey here uh, was one of the authors of something that uh, we look at as one of the greater learning tools that we've had, and that's delivered uncompromised. If you've read that report, I, I highly recommend it. Um, in that report, there were a great deal of point outs that we could do better in the DOD. One of them that I took kind of a rally call was to get level set standards for cybersecurity. We don't have them. Um, we have NIST 171, we have ISO 27001, we have AIA, we have a litany. So in March of this year, um, the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, Ms. Ellen Lord, charged me with creating the cybersecurity maturity model certification. We have just released, as of today, on the CMMC website, Rev.4 for public comment. It is out, it is live, it is robust. What this will be will be the cyber certification, and I say this, and I know it's a big task, that every company within the DOD supply chain, not just the DIB, the supply chain, the 300,000 contractors, are going to be required to ascertain and, and get certified to do work with the Department of Defense. This model is out for comment. We will be actually releasing it to a consortium in January, which will train the trainers, essentially. So because we understand in the building we can't do it, that we needed to partner with industry. And I, I say that, and I, 
I mean partner with industry. We created the CMMC model in a collaborative event with Johns Hopkins, Carnegie Mellon, DIB, SEC, um, Harvey. I mean, there were a great deal of people who have put into this. Um, the model is based on levels one through five, one being equivalent to FAR 52, Level three is equivalent to NIST 171 compliance. So if you're saying you're 171 compliant, the self-attestation, and you're doing your job, you'll be CMMC level three. And level four and five are what we're calling NIST, the Bravo version, that enhanced version for critical technologies and weapon systems. That's levels four and five. It will go live and be starting to show up in RFIs in June of 2020. It will be in RFPs in the fall of 2020. And everybody around here understand, we understand security will be an allowable cost. We know what we're asking for, but if we value security as delivered uncompromised, um, stated very clearly, the cost, schedule, and performance don't function without security. They're, they're invaluable. So that is one thing that we're doing to uh, get cybersecurity standards level set for everybody. Then we're moving that into the supply chain risk management. And we in OSD have a great partnership with our USDI partners, with DHS. I sit on the FASCA, the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Council, and we are looking at cybersecurity standards and how to incorporate them into giving supply chain illumination. We get everyone on a level set playing field for cybersecurity, and then we can really start looking at our supply chain, where our most and, and greatest vulnerabilities lie, and how we can work together in a collaborative event with industry, because with 70 plus percent of our data living on your networks, it is no longer a moment, it's a me thing or a you thing, it's a we thing. And we have to come together and work together in a collaborative fashion to defeat our adversaries. We cannot do it alone. So CMMC was the first foray into that. We're here to discuss the supply chain risk management and how cybersecurity plays into that today, what the illumination tools will look like, what kind of requirements we're talking about, and how we can come together to deliver uncompromised. There, was that a Great. good enough plug? spectacular, <laughs> under five minutes. Um, so Bob, you're here with DHS, correct? I see you, and um, I think that's you, where I work still, Harvey. Uh, and you know, you the renaming of CISA. Uh, how are you playing in the supply chain space as you perceive it for your coordination with DoD? Sure. Um, let, let me put us in the the space in, in general, and then you know talk about some of the connection points with what Katie's doing in, in, in general the DoD mission. But. Um, let, Taking it in a broader perspective, as part of the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, you know, two of the things we spend a lot of our time thinking about, making sure that they're secure, one of which is federal networks. Um, we obviously have some authorities' responsibility across the federal, not the civilian.gov landscape to do what we can to um, ensure security of, of the .gov, and then the other area is critical infrastructure writ large. Katie talked a little bit about the defense industrial base, which is one of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, but when we're thinking about critical infrastructure, we're thinking about across the, the 16 sectors, electricity, banking, finance, water, et cetera, and in, in this case, particularly around supply chain, the IT, information technology and communication sectors, where we serve as the sector-specific agency. And, you know, what the federal role is in securing critical infrastructure is different than what the federal role is in, in securing um, things that we're purchasing, what the federal role is in securing things that are our own networks. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the nuances of our approach across that. Uh, so with that in mind, as part of the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, the National Risk Management Center sits within CISA with the responsibility to look at the things that are the biggest strategic risks whether it be to federal networks or more particularly critical infrastructure, and make sure we are bringing together folks, bringing the best information available about those risks, um, which understanding threats, vulnerabilities, consequences about the risks so that we, we, our critical infrastructure faces as a nation, and bringing the people together who can do something to reduce that risk. Uh, so when we established the National Risk Management Center last summer, one of our first top priorities uh, for reasons I think are pretty self-evident, was uh, making progress about securing the ICT supply chain. Um, and uh, 
That's because, and, and I, I'm not saying anything that th those of you in this room don't understand, that's because we see adversaries out there right now, particularly nation states and particularly China and Russia and, and to a lesser extent Iran and North Korea, doing things and, and putting a, our supply chains at threat, um, whether that is through sort of longer strategic threats to the supply chain or more taking advantage of operational vulnerabilities across the supply chain. We see this as an attack vector that is only increasing at this stage and is something that has the potential to put some of our cr critical infrastructure in, in sort of a strategic frame as an area that using supply chains as a, a way to attack critical infrastructure. Um, and so what we're trying to do um, at CISA and through the Risk Management Center is really get a better understanding of that risk and then bring together industry and government work across, across government to do something against that risk. And so if the threat's increasing, um, let's try to, you know, you know, we're obviously gonna do what we can as a government to make sure that, you know, the threat's under control, but then let's try to um, do things to better understand where the vulnerabilities are and what, what are the most critical elements of the supply chain. And when we're talking about supply chain risk here, we're, we're largely talking about, you know, the classic triumvirate of risk factors, availability, confidentiality, and integrity. Um, and so what we've done within DHS over the last six months per a task in, by the president is really try to break down the ICT supply chain to understand um, the most critical elements of the supply chain and then use that to apply risk thinking into uh, available decision support to, to do things to um, put more trust into the supply chain. Um, we, we've done that through an assessment that we completed working across the interagency and we, with industry where we um, broke down the components of the ICT supply chain. Um, we broke down into several areas uh, at, at the highest level, local user access and transmission and storage and processing and system management then what are the sub-elements within, within those supply chains, and then how can you think about where the most critical elements within the supply chain and where there's concentrations of risk, where, where it's harder to um, provide security and confidence, where there's a potential that a nation state can exploit elements of an ICT supply chain to really cause bad, bad things as it, it relates to the availability, confidentiality, and integrity of things we care about. Um, so we took that approach. We've um, completed an assessment and delivered it to the Secretary of Commerce um, per the executive order that the President signed um, in, in the spring to support the Secretary of Commerce's use of emergency authorities uh, to, uh, you know, ensure that there's more trust and that we're, bad things are not getting to the most critical elements of the supply chain. Um, but we thought that in doing that assessment, you know, it was done explicitly called out because of an executive order, but we think it has broader application as we more broadly think about sources of risk. And so we're going to build off that assessment. We're going to co continue to put information together to um, better understand where in, where in critical infrastructure supply chains, where in ICT supply chains there are sources of risk and use that to influence um, a, a number of different uh, decision support uh, about you know, putting more trust into supply chains. Uh, a couple main avenues but by which DHS is doing that work. Uh, one is, is uh, Katie mentioned the FASCA. Um, so we, we obviously, uh, with our role in, in, in the civil space, you know, our, the FASCA is very important to us, the Federal Acquisition Security Council, and making sure that um, you know the best information is available to federal procurement officials to support um, to support decisions of, of what gets into federal, what gets on federal systems, and are there supply chain concerns? Um, we we have in the past used our binding operational directive authority across DHS, most particularly with Kaspersky Labs software, to make sure that things that we don't trust are pulled off of federal networks. I think the FASCA is a way to more institutionalize that process writ large, and as we better have better understanding of sources of risk, connections to threat actors or nation states that we're concerned about and sources of risk, we can use those authorities um, to help uh, secure federal networks. And then on the industry side, uh, I co-chair a, a supply chain task force with the sector coordinating council leads of, of the IT sector uh, and the communications sector, and we are working through a public-private partnership to enhance public-private information sharing mechanisms for information sharing, get past some of the current barriers that, that make information sharing hard um, around that to better understand and promulgate standards and, and ways to think about threat evaluation to support uh, decision making and then to incentivize uh, 
satisfies good supply chain risk management practices, buying from authorized resellers or original equipment manufacturers, um, thinking through how best to use qualified bidder lists and qualified manufactured lists so that, again, we, we can put in a system where the things that get into supply chains are things that we trust. So it's that combination, I th think, in, in you know, the question about how do we relate to DOD. I think we have a similar objective. Um, DOD is going to move a, a significant portion of the market through the work that you're doing. You're, you're going to lead in, in a lot of ways. The federal government writ large can do some of the same things. I think the more alignment there is, companies like Scotts do business both in, in DOD and in the civilian space and then have influence in, in other areas. The more alignment there is of how we're going to achieve the objectives of some of the processes we're put in place, I think the better off we're going to be. And as we each work to sort of improve our information sharing environments, make sure there's a collective, collective sharing of information. Thank you, Bob. So what I heard is that we, we, we can look forward to some more Kaspersky notifications coming out of DHS. Like. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, we have uh, Bill over here, Stevens, who I've known for a long time, who used to work for DSS, Defense Security Services, but now is working for the new Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency. They're going from about seven or 800 people to around 7,000. Uh, Charlie Phelan is currently in charge, and it is quite an extraordinary new organization being created. So can you explain how you're part of this fight, Bill? Yes, uh, uh, yeah, we're actually, I didn't ever get an opportunity to correct Harvey, but I'd like to correct him now. So <laughs> we've gone from about 900 people to about 12,000 people. So. so I underestimated your original <laughs> at full size. So uh, e even bigger and better. Thank uh, you. So, uh, so I'm the director of counterintelligence, at least today, for that organization. And uh, so very quickly, on the 1st of October is actually when the organizations officially come together. We've been working together as two organizations for quite a while, the National Background Investigations Bureau and DCSA. Mr. Charlie Phelan, who, was, who is the director of NBIB, will remain the director until the end of the month. And at that point, and he, right now he's also the acting director of DCSA. He will be the acting director of the new DCSA, will, which will have absorbed NBIB by the 1st of October. The, the way we're going to be essentially set up is we're going to have a, a, vet, a vetting enterprise or entity or directorate. I don't know what the name is yet. And basically the responsibility there is to deliver a trusted workforce. There's going to be a critical technology protection entity um, or enterprise or directorate and their responsibility is to deliver uh, trusted facilities or trusted companies. The counterintelligence piece essentially is to stop our adversaries from compromising either the trusted workforce or the, tr uh, or the trusted facilities or companies. Uh, the intention of how we're moving right now is very deliberate is so that we can continue to perform our mission for everybody with minimal disruption. That's how the reorganization has been set in place thus far. So that's the initial response. So to get this piece, the second piece started here, um, and everyone here especially, I suspect, knows the threat uh, to U.S. technology and information is as profound today as it's ever been, more profound today than it's ever been. And uh, it doesn't matter what the domain is. And I think it's uh, part of my comments here will be making clear Drawing a clear distinction is something we do, but our opponents don't do. They execute blended operations all the time, and it's critical to, to know that. You don't have to be a counterintelligence expert to realize we're under the pressure. All you have to do is read the paper and believe some of what it is that you read, and, uh, and that, that would be plenty enough. Uh, fortunately, in one respect, um, well, um, I've been able to watch this for 10 years, um, and, it's, and it's been a real education for me. I'm a retired Air Force officer, and I did this in the Air Force uh, in OSI. But from what I'm getting to watch now and see now, it's an incredible education. It's an unfortunate one. Um, our opponents have the initiative. And uh, for those of you who know in military terms, it, the, the gracious way of describing that is we're not winning. And that's, that's the way I would describe it. I've been able to watch with my team and the rest of uh, what was DSS and is now DCSA how our opponents actually make, a, make the approaches. We can see which country's coming at us, which companies they're pursuing, which technologies they're going after, and which methods they're using. And we've built that into a method to actually harden the target and defend our capability, and we're getting better at executing that. Um, but I'm pretty proud of how it's turned out. Uh, we can at least describe uh, what's occurring to us, and those that are uh, interested in moving against the problem actually have at least a tool to do that. But what we're talking about today, I think, is clearly an imperative. Uh, we have got to get better at that. And we're very fortunate of the effort that, uh, uh, that she's working on now to actually illuminate the supply chain and actually bring, uh, bring uh, power to bear on a very, very serious problem. 
So, and I look forward to it, particularly the supply chain illumination for our interest uh, in DCSA. So very quickly, there's three things that I see that are a challenge that we need to deal with, and uh, probably not a surprise to folks here. One is, I briefly mentioned it, demarcation between cyber and cyber, the way we make those separations. We make it, but our opponents don't. They execute cyber operations and they execute non-cyber operations against us, whichever is going to work, whatever the Foreign Intelligence Service or the other activities are interested in and how they can best get something from us, that's how they're going to do that. An example of where it creates a problem, and I think is, uh, for example, if you imagine a secure um, network or environment, that actually, you're actually creating a situation where there is a significant vulnerability. Now, the cyber folks might be able to lock that down, but are they locking down the people that are touching it? That's the question from a non-cyber point of view. Are they locking those people down? And are they locking down the communications, the unclassified communications they're using when they, that they're sitting possibly there at their desk or using elsewhere? That is what I propose is actually where our opponents are going to come after us when these capabilities are locked down. And I hope as we move forward that the folks that work the cyber game recognize that's happening around them and that is where the opponent is going to go. So that is one. Another is the demarcation between the classification levels. Um, I think a lot of people here recognize that when we've called something classified in the past, we acted as if that meant there's no vulnerability or no threat, when in fact I think we've all learned, particularly in this room, that's not the case. When we did that, um, what we allowed to occur is our, oper the, our opponents to actually take advantage of that unclassified world to get the information that's necessary to get next to the classified effort uh, and move to compromises. So, at least from my perspective, that demarcation is another challenge that we need to overcome. And then finally, securing, man and, and um, Ms. Arrington mentioned this, security being managed as an expense to be reduced rather than a national security objective to be achieved. I think the, the, what that, that comment recognizes, in fact, is there is tremendous value in keeping a secret. There is tremendous value in being able to hold, inf to be able to convey information, under your initiative and not the, not the uh, unapproved initiative of somebody else. It's a big deal. Just keeping a secret. There's tremendous value associated with that. And I would propose we create a great vulnerability because we've been unable to actually monetize that or value that. We have got to come to grips with that because what is more valuable, a compromised capability or an uncompromised capability? How much would we pay to get something back that we've lost? How much would we pay to have not lost it in the first place. Those are the questions I would propose that we need to ask. A lot of it, and a lot of it has to do with our ability to secure not just the supply chain and the cyber game, but the entire enterprise. Well, thank you. Um, so, Bill, as we say, you know, the four levels of attack are software, hardware, carbon units, you know them as people, and ISP, which is the way we communicate, and then the actual information. And that what makes the supply chain complicated. But the object of our affection is sitting beside Katie on the right, which is Lockheed Martin. And as you know... <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike is the CISO, but we're all about the primes. Everything we're talking about supply chain is starts with the prime and works down when it, when it comes to the dip. So, Mike, if I can make you uh, Secretary of Defense for an hour, what would you do to help supply chain issues vis-a-vis -vis the primes? Give me well, <laughs> well, first, Harvey, thanks for the promotion. So I'm Scott Rush, by the way. I work for Mike Gordon, the CISO at Lockheed Martin. Um, so uh, I guess I'm really going to focus on three things, and Katie hit on some, as did Bill and Bob. I guess from a prime perspective and a Lockheed Martin perspective, the first thing Katie said, which I totally agree with, we are mission partners when it comes to protecting sensitive information throughout the uh, DIB supply chain. So it's been a battle that I think all of us have been fighting for, you know, 10 plus years. Um, I think the multi-tier aspect is one now that is, getting, you know, quite frankly, getting a lot of attention. So the three things that I'd like to talk about are how to harmonize efforts. There are a lot of efforts going on within the DOD and industry, how to bring them together into a holistic, cohesive, you know, attack plan as opposed to right now they feel a little independent and, you know, uh, overlapping. Second thing is how do we work better together? Um, and, you know, there's one example that I'll give how uh, industry, the large brands have worked with the NBA 
Um, you know, I think that's a, it's a good model. And then the third thing, I'll talk about a DIB supply chain task force that just stood up under the DIB Sector Coordinating Council, which is a, a DHS construct, and it actually gives us a vehicle to work with government in a more effective fashion. So I think from, you know, the, the first area and all the different things going on, and Katie mentioned the CMMC, and that's obviously getting a lot of attention now. It's going to impact everything from acquisition to how companies get, get evaluated. Um, but along with that, we're still seeing, obviously, 800-171 Bravo in terms of a different set of requirements or enhanced requirements. There's many DOD services that are proposing additional requirements on top of what's required now by 800-171, and in some cases are different than what's proposed in 171 Bravo. So, yeah, and so we're seeing a lot of different requirements, you know, come across, and I'll say for a large enterprise that, from an unclassified perspective, manages a large um, IT environment common systems to support on multiple programs and contracts, having a, distant, a different set of requirements becomes very problematic. You know, it's hard if the Navy says, here's the 10 things I want you to do above and beyond the DFARS, and the Army says, well, maybe these three things, and the Air Force says, no, these eight. And I'm looking, well, I've got one email system, so how can I do 10, three, and eight? All right, so, I mean, that's something I think that, you know, we need to wrestle with, and hopefully between CMMC, mm -hmm. 800-171, and 171 Bravo, we can kind of, you know, cook you know, kind of come together. I think from an oversight perspective, and again, I think the CMMC cuts across three things we see happening. Requirements, you know, what's needed to protect data. Oversight, we have to move beyond self-attestation. And then the third thing is how do we bake cyber into the acquisition process. CMMC cuts across all three. All three. Again, we're seeing different things happening at each level, though, in addition to CMMC. From an oversight perspective, DCMA has moved out on, I think, what's called DIPCAT assessments. Mm -hmm. So there's a scoring assessment methodology where they look for a company's implementation of the controls outlined in 800-171. I think the scoring system is something like 110 is positive, minus 300 and something is as bad as you can get. And they're coming in, they've started with the large primes. You know, we had the opportunity to spend three days, and, and actually it's a, it's, it's, it's a good team that's coming in, a lot of good dialogue, and they are purposely trying to learn, you know, how to do these assessments, you know, in conjunction with industry. Um, but again, so if you take CMMC, you take the DIBCAT assessments, CPSR reviews have now have some cyber baked into that based on the memos that came out from Ms. Lord at the end of last year. And then if you look at the comprehensive security reviews, you're getting a lot of oversight now all focused on pretty much the same topic area. So how do we bring those things together so maybe it's the CMMC now basically maps to all those other things or takes, you know, you know, takes the place of all those other things so companies and the government can expend one set of resources Amen. to assess industry once, right? And I think from an acquisition standpoint, we are supportive of particularly, and I know Katie said, you know, building the maturity model into the acquisition process. I think from a Lockheed perspective and talking to our large primes, as a go, no go decision, that we, we feel that's a good thing, right? So if again, I'll pick maturity level three to bid on a contract or perform, you have to be maturity level three or you can't perform. We understand that and we think that's a good thing. What we would rather not see happen because we think it would dampen collaboration is if, we, if it becomes part of the evaluation criteria. And that's why, so I'll, sorry, yes. I don't mean to, it is absolutely a go, no go decision because the one thing that the primes have showed us is that to really, um, when safety, when you're talking about aeronautics, right, safety is the paramount. So they share and they're collaborative about safety because lives matter. We really need to take this paradigm and look at it. Lives are on the line with this, ladies and gentlemen. It's not that our adversaries are taking the money. That's they're taking, what, $600 billion a year in some estimates of your tax dollars. But think about that, that young man or woman sitting on the front line that if they go to hit the missile launch and it doesn't work, they die. This is not a game. This is not some cloud aspiration. This is truly how our adversaries are looking to, to beat us. And we have to be collaborative on this. It's not, you know, so we, we look at the partnership, especially with Lockheed. What we have been able to do with the CMMC, but look at what how we're helping getting software. I mean, uh, security baked into the acquisition process. We're rewriting DoD 5000. We're doing that because we need to have cyber requirements baked in at the get go. What DCMA is doing right now is that bridge gap between now 
where we are today and where we'll be in a year <coughs> and a half from now. So I think you will see that, you know, I've, I've met with all the SAEs for the, the services, and they have bought into the CMMC being the, the one security, cybersecurity model that they'll be using um, for the DOD, and hopefully we can convince our, our partners in, in the federal acquisition side, yeah, I'm looking at you, <laughs> to adopt it as well. But it's we have to get together on this to protect the supply chain because our adversaries aren't going at us at the Lockheed Martin top prime level. They're going at that small business, that SIBR, that OTA that's the most vulnerable. And we can't expect our companies in that paradigm to protect themselves against a the nation state. So let, let me ask this question because one of the phrases that is used is the illumination. Mm -hmm of the supply chain. I like that because I'm often accused of being one of the Bavarian Illuminati. So the concept that we're now going to illuminate, the concept is always something that is pushed back on is how do we go from tier one to tier 78. So like, yes. how, are, how, as a, how are, do you see this illumination working and what are the advantages and disadvantages of how you're going to go forward? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the example I was going to give when it comes to collaboration and, and, and Katie had hit on, you know, this problem. Um, we started working with the MDA a couple of years ago, and we actually identified three objectives. Major General Knudsen happened to be at the MDA at the time, for those that know him, and there were three things he said. I want to know where my data is, the CDI within the, the multi-tier dip supply chain. I want to know how well it's protected, and if it's not protected well enough, I want to protect it. Right? So they were the three objectives. So one thing that we kicked off, and we actually are now piloting under four contracts amongst some of the large primes, was an effort by contract to illuminate where CDI goes on a particular contract. So it starts with the MDA, who basically says to the prime, I want to know what my, my multi-tier is on this particular contract. Prime goes in, identifies all their suppliers that have CDI, contract language, a tool was built to support the pilot, and basically you go down tier by tier. There are some, you know, some limitations we actually built into the tool for business reasons at this point that can be undone just with a software change, but the NDA will actually get to see the entire supply chain. So right now, Lockheed is pretty much done with our portion of the pilot. We've done it for one of our contracts, so the MDA is, MDA is looking at the data, they like what they're seeing, they like what the pilot has shown them. Um, but from a Lockheed perspective, we obviously get to see our one tier, our tier one, we'll call it. Tier twos and threes, we don't get to see for business reasons. Right, sometimes our tier twos don't want to tell us who their suppliers are. Sometimes they don't care, sometimes they do. So what we see is aggregated data. So let's say Acme Widgets is one of our tier one suppliers. We'll know somewhere under Acme Widgets they have a DFARS problem, right? But I won't know which of their suppliers has it. I just have to go to Acme and say, hey, you know, you've got a problem down at your next tier, you, you gotta go fix that. So I mean, so this pilot's been going on for about eight to nine months. Early results are good. I think as important as what it's done for the NBA in a small scale, I think we've learned a lot in terms of how to roll something like this out in a multi-tier supply chain. Um, I think they've learned a lot about the requirements they need and they don't need. Um, and I think it's really going to inform a path forward from an NDA perspective. And I know they're talking to Katie and others within the DOD about how this might apply to the broader supply chain illumination efforts. So we have a, a, a tremendous amount of supply chain illumination pathfinders going on in the DOD right now, a tremendous. Part of the, the FASCA, the, the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Council, is to pull together and figure out. Um, legislators got ahead of this. So in this year's version of the NDAA, they've actually called out what they think these supply chain illumination tools should look like. Um, we came back with the DOD, DHS, and we all made some, um, I would say, iterative comments, and we asked it not to be mandatory, but to consider, right? We, we want to be able to look. What we're struggling with right now, so the Pathfinders with MDA, um, there have been others, they are very, very good tools. But there are some barriers, right? So a lot of these take open source feeds, right? And they bring them in so they can illuminate in a dashboard. So we can actually look at, you know, where in a geopolitical area we may have some vulnerabilities in the supply chain. Um, we can look at um, CFIUS cases and we can see, you know, how those interact with the supply chain. The, the, the challenge is where do we maintain that data inside the DOD, right? Because that's a big one. That's our adversaries golden egg it, to get that. So it, it's a classified system, ultimately, is what it gets to. But we also have the visibility in the, the MDA models. We can see the entire supply chain, which is, you know, a benefit to us, 
what we're figuring out is how do we share that, right? How do we inform each other? Because if we have a Kapersky event, how do we illuminate it in the supply chain to see where those, those segments are and how do we mitigate them off? Because, and I'll use Ms. Wibben who's sitting in the, the front desk, there's a whiteboard in my office that is Carrie Wibben all over the top of it. Um, is and that we a good were, thing or a bad thing? It's a very, it's a good thing, oh, right? No. So we discussed what a vulnerability is, right? An 806 event is a pretty big deal. And those events cost money, and there needs to be policy and process. But if we can figure out a way to mitigate within the supply chain that risk, and we can buy down the risk and buy up the uncertainty, that's what we want in these illumination tools. Um, we are moving to them. Congress has put money appropriated for them. This is happening. What we're deciding now are what are the requirements? What are we looking at? And what is the, the value add and the visibility? So, Katie, so Sorry. one of the issues that comes up in these discussions is, um, you know, Mike raised that there are a number of efforts going on across USG. We have a, a number of places where information is held. Mm -hmm. As you know, there's pending legislation that, that what should be created is the National Supply Chain Information Center, and that would be placed under Bill Evanina's shop at the DNI for counterintelligence. So, Bill, this has always been a hot issue, which is DOD acquisition world, counterintelligence understanding of where threats come from. The acquisition world and the counterintelligence worlds are a different, two different breeds of cats. They don't always get together well in the same sort of uh, kitty litter. So the question is, where do you see this issue of counterintelligence, intelligence, acquisition, and do we need a new place to store information that will have access that can come back to the DIB and the rest of the business, people do business with USG? Well, I'm just thrilled that um, it appears that the, the professionals that work, the supply chain, the acquisition community, that in fact there's going to be an effort to, in a significant way, illuminate that supply chain. From my, from my perspective, um, we, deter, we deter, detect, and disrupt. And the bottom line is, is that they, I, from my, I, the way I see it is they will be observing and managing their own supply chain. They will be identifying which, if in fact there are uh, indicators of uh, inappropriate activity, and that's the, the deter piece would be the defenses, the detect pieces, we, what they would be able to see, nefarious activity of our opponents, and then we would uh, facilitate the return serve. Now, if that's in a central place and it's only one place, it scares me that there would be only one place. I think that would have utility, certainly. Um, uh, but uh, I find the effort of having as many people focused on managing their own supply chain concerned about whether it's secured or not, and then them being able to, uh, because they will know their supply chains best, uh, as, does, as will industry, the, to compel them to do it or ask them to do it or if the incentives are appropriate that they do that, that's what's exciting to me. I do believe the rest of it, uh, we can do the rest of it as long as, uh, as that's executed appropriately. Okay, uh, one of the issues also I'm gonna do generally across the board, it's the, one, the two sexiest topics now when you walk around Washington. One is supply chain and the other one is 5G. We're all sort of focused on 5G, the myth of 5G, the reality of 5G. How, as I go down the road, how is DHS, how is Lockheed, how's DOD, how's DCSA, how are you approaching and thinking about the 5G issue? And by the way, for those of you who have trouble uh, uh, with the sort of the vibrancy of the panel, there's a 5G report written by INSA, which you may want to look at as their take on how INSA sees 5G. So let's start with you, sir, Bob. Can we start with me, Harvey? Yeah, it's sir. far away from me. Um, so, you know, 5G, I, I talk about it as one of the most, if not the most significant infrastructure build-outs we've seen in the, the last 10, 20 years. And so if you care about securing infrastructure, we're still early enough in the 5G evolution that I think we can get ahead of designing in some of the security that will um, leave us in, in a better stead overall, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty doctrinate person at this point. Where's the risk going to be, and what can you do to, to address the risk? In terms of the 5G network, you know, the, the risk is both 
within the design of the system, how it gets fielded, the component piece parts of it, and then as you get further out to the edge and the connections in, in the multitude and in, in the order of magnitude more um, devices that are connected to the Internet of Things, the things that will enable uh, autonomous transportation and others like that. And so you do have this potential exposure space that is larger than anything we've seen before. Um, then it becomes a question of how do you design in security within that exposure space. So, so just because you have, you know, 10x, 100x more potential places that, that you can go after the 5G network, that's not going to have, you, you know, cascading impacts across the whole network in terms of functioning things that we ultimately are going to depend on precision um, through 5G on or, you know, connecting points of information. I think as we you know, work through these problems, we have some built-in advantages in terms of some of the, uh, you, you know, software-defined networking in, in ways w that the 5G network will be rolled out for use that can be taken advantage of for security purposes as well. Um, but then I, I think, and I suspect we'll get into this part of the conversation, how do you get as much trusted vendor material into the 5G evolution, and this connects very much with the supply chain points, and why, you know, if we have reasons to be concerned about, um, and I, I'd suggest we have reasons to be concerned about um, component parts that are designed in certain countries and, and under the influence of certain governments, how do we make sure that the incentive pieces aren't, aren't out there, um, you know, to buy cheap, um, or, or, you know, that there's com competition to, to things that, uh, that we can't trust, how do we um, work with industry to set a policy agenda, set standards in a way that will uh, allow security to be taken seriously and uh, allow for you know, security to de be designed in? So, so that's how we're, we're thinking about the risk. That's how we're thinking some of the opportunities. I certainly think um, you know, we, sh we should be very active as a country, and, w and we're getting more active on the standard side to do that. We should be very active uh, as we as 5G decisions are made, deployment decisions being made internationally, as they're being made in, in areas around the country, to get the best information into the hands of the people who are making that decisions and incentivize security to be a, a consideration. And, you know, that's what we're going to be doing within DHS. We think we can um, play a, a key role in partnership with DOD, in, in partnership with the FCC, the State Department, um, various elements of the Commerce Department, uh, others, energy and transportation, who are thinking about infrastructure to do things that will influence the the 5G design. But but I you know in, in talking to industry, I, I think this is an opportunity where we can end up with a with a network that's been designed with security from the get go, and you know we have an opportunity here. Yeah, and I would say from a, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, I mean, particularly when you look at the one aspect of the problem you talked about, which is, you know, trusted components. I mean, there we rely a lot on our partnerships with the intelligence community, with our DOD partners in terms of, you know, you know products that, you know, maybe are suspect or, you know, companies where there are concerns about, you know, just the trusted nature of the components. So, you know, again, I think right now that we're leveraging those partnerships as much as we can, you know, as we look at 5G. Um, you know, again, I think we rely a lot more on DHS when it comes to the actual design of the 5G networks and, you know, the overall infrastructure. Um, you know, that's obviously something that you have more, uh, um, you know, play in than, than, than we do, so to speak. But again, when it comes to a consumer or user of the 5G network, we really rely on some of the uh, intelligence uh, the partnerships we have with the DOD and, um, you know, the intelligence community. So in DOD, there's a multitude of efforts going on on 5G. Um, RNA, of course, is, is taking it and how we're going to build it into our, our NSS and, and weapon systems and how that works. Um, for me, in acquisition, we have to look at what 5G will do. So right now, if there's an exfil and we find out 30 days later, imagine the volume of an exfil with 5G. In a second, terabytes of data are gone. So we have to really, you know, the, it's where we are right now in, in acquisition is building in security protocols into the requirements, building security and cyber resiliency into our, our KPPs. We're making it a standard. That's where I talked about we're rewriting the 5,000. We're retraining our PMs on how to look at it. I'm working with NSA in a collaborative manner to get ISEs and SSEs involved in the actual products and, and how we're making them. Because when 5G turns on, I mean, it'll eventually turn on for everyone. 
the problem is going to be scalability. So in our supply chain illumination tools, that's what we're going to be looking for with the Intel community, is the moment that we see something happening, because it will happen so fast and on such a, a monumental level, how do we stop it and, and see the predictive analysis of what, the fi what it can be and thwart it before it happens? Because in the 5G environment, a second is a, literally a, a, a petabyte, a terabyte of data gone. And we, we, you know, we have to have the, the rigors in place before 5G. So I think that all the efforts that we're doing right now are the crawl, walk, run to get there. Um, I still say that uh, as a country, um, I am impressed with what our allied partners are doing to help us in this issue. I think the executive order from the president when it came to certain manufacturers of other 5G products was a first step. But I think we have a long way to go. Um, but we are making great strides in getting there. But security getting baked in at the core is everything. So um, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on very elegant defense of everything in the Department of Defense, everything in, in industry. Um, uh, and my, the answer ultimately is the same, right? Deter, detect, disrupt. The speed and the skill with which you apply to all of those is really, really what matters. If something is taken, uh, like Katie's talking about, we lose, if we lose so much more, so much faster, I would propose the only way to really come to grips with that effectively would be changing the calculus of the opponent. And we can do that, and um, I think that it's part of, part of the efforts that I think with the work that we are working on. And um, um, I just hope we, it, it's interesting to watch how it is that our government comes to grips with it. I think, I think that we have an answer for it, I just hope that we can pull everything together, connect uh, industry to actually decision making in government because we're in a nation fight. We're an all of nation fight, not just a nation state fight, but an all of nation fight. And we can't do that without industry. Industry reporting the threats, reporting the threats and vulnerabilities with speed, and then our ability to assess those and respond and respond with great speed. But it's scary talking about the 5G issue. Uh, so one question from the audience is, they understand how we're having these multiple efforts to try to rate the supply chain and create the CCMR, CCMC, but the question that they had is, how are we educating a acquisitions and purchasing personnel in government about how to understand supply chain risks? So within DAU, we have, we're reconstructing That's like the, the, the defense acquisition university. university. We are rewriting 5,000. So by show of hands, does anyone understand what DOD 5,000 is? Okay, it's, it's huge. And we are breaking it down so that it's no longer a 3,000 page document. It is now condensed down, we're, we're at a seven pages. And then what we're creating are tailored, um, enclosures. So there will be a cybersecurity enclosure. There will be a program protection plan enclosure. And what we're doing, on, and there are multiple of them, we're teaching our PMs how to critically think about security in their programs holistically. For far too long in, in the environment of our PMs, we have done a great job at certifying them but we haven't done a great job of qualifying them, right? We make you go to a class and you check the box and you pass it. Um, my boss is Mr. Kevin Fahey. Um, he'll tell you he's the longest serving PM in the history of all time. I think he's worked for the government 1,002 years. The day he went into t DAU for his, his first session, he took a test. And when he graduated, he scored lower than when he did on the, in, in the start date, right? So we have got to get better on this. So we are apt, to, we're going at it right now. You'll see it at the end of this fiscal year, I'm sorry, calendar year, December. We're rolling out the new 5,000. We are starting with an entire new curriculum. We're also going into what we're calling um, certification or badges, credentialing. So if you're working in a software intensive program or you're working in a critical technology, we're sending PMs to very specific courses to get educated in webinars, three-day fashions, because we need to do this at the speed of light. And DAU is also looking at a large partnership with the academic 
um, environment. Most recently, we just did a course with Darden. Um, they're integrating a lot of that, so it's a huge change in DAU culturally, and that's how we're moving out to retrain our PMs how to take cybersecurity and security to the core um, from onset. So the 5,000 you believe will be rolled out at the end of calendar year? Yes, it's um, due, uh, Ms. Stacy Cummings, she's um, Mr. Fahey's principal, is in charge of it. They have the instruction document within the building. I'm working on the cybersecurity piece now and I have a due out at the end of the September. So you guys will see it in December. So we could look for a Christmas present underneath the There's tree. a lot coming out of DOD. I mean, culturally, we're changing <laughs> yes, hugely. And, and on the an analogy with Kevin, it was the education as opposed to Kevin that you think? Uh, yeah. Because okay. <laughs> we both know Fahey. So um, the other question is that has been raised is the electronics question. And as you know, we have huge dependency on the creation by foreigners who are controlling those markets, and then as Mike raised, how we can certify the component parts on those boards. So this is a huge problem. It's a DHS problem, it's a, a private sector problem, and it's a big DOD issue. Mm -hmm. So what is your sense about how we can get our hands around that? Some people are arguing we need to have a new industrial policy we need to be supporting domestic manufacturers for certain critical key elements. Can we do that on scale? Where do you three break on that issue with the issues that are circling around Washington about how to solve it? It's a problem that's bigger than any one of our agencies, I think. And, you know, I think some of what you've seen by the attention we've put together, if this is a U.S. government, you've seen more conversations about the economic agencies, putting trade, putting international policy, putting national security policy together to think about the cascading impacts of any yeah. one of these decisions and relate to that. I mean, a lot of the premise here is security has risen to the, the level of things that were decisions made for different reasons and security was just assumed that we'd figure out how to secure it later, including how we've, we've evolved as, as industries um, internationally. You know, hesitant about an, international, an industrial policy that's too centralized and to try to control these things, right? We're, we're gonna try to do this, but let's keep putting the requirement out, let's put the market out, and let's make sure that, you know, the right people are at the table when their policy interventions be, being talked about. So, so that's more of what I've talked about. I think what you will see more specifically is there will be some areas where as we further say, see elements of supply chains that we think are really critical, that there's not enough diversity of where that's being provided and there's reasons to be concerned and then that's where you, you come into with the intervention, I think at, at a government side in terms of some sort of incentives. But, but I, I would have the intervention come later in the process based on, based on you know, overall system than try to design from the get-go. That, that's kind so of how we I'll still stay with you and we'll go down the, the panel, but one of the other issues raised is the capacity and capability of DHS. That's always raised in contrast to what DOD's resources are. Mm -hmm. So what is your sense about, given this new mission and given the authorities, the capabilities and capacity of where DHS is to deal with the size of the problem? Well, they're, they're different roles, right? So c capacity, I think we can correlate to size and budget. Um, and so that's really, but, but our, our responsibility is to, particularly around the critical infrastructure space, is to catalyze this happening integrate efforts, look for opportunities to take advantage of where there are capabilities across. So, so DHS shouldn't develop all capabilities around supply chain security in terms of design supply chain. You know, we share information, we incentivize, we, we push for requirements, we identify risks, and then we, we try to bring the right people together to address those risks. So, you know, I, of course I always want more capacity, um, but, you know, that, that will happen organically in terms of capability. I think the more we do this, you know, we'll be able to take advantage of capability, particularly with DOD, and DOD will be doing and should be doing a ton of stuff to make sure that national security missions are going to be executed and that's going to have benefit, that going to be, ex there's not risk, unnecessary risk to national security missions. That's what they need to do. We, we need that as a country. That's going to have great benefit across the ecosystem to the extent that DHS can help 
um, DOD understand where there's other opportunities to apply that to things that are perhaps civilian delivered that, that um, are key to national security missions. We're certainly going to partner with that. And to the extent that DOD is doing things that are moving the overall national security space and, and developing capabilities, you know, conversation we've had for years with DOD and you put NSA into this conversation, how do we take some of what's been developed for one application for, for military national security use and help work with industry to commercialize some of that. Obviously, that happens through DOD processes, but are there opportunities for critical infrastructure to take advantage of tools? And so I see taking advantage of DOD's capability and capacity and looking for other opportunities to do things that are maybe outside their direct mission, but clearly have national security benefits, such as protecting critical infrastructure. Can I Absolutely. jump on? Okay. Yeah. So, as far as you know, investments in what we're doing to get a hold of, you know, when bad things are happening or bad people are creating malicious code. Um, Ms. Lord uh, kicked off, a uh, press release was I think two weeks ago, the trusted capital marketplace. So when we have emerging technologies that need um, a capital infusion, we need to ensure that the right companies are investing, right? Because if you're a startup company and you're looking for venture capital funding, you're not necessarily looking to see if it's coming from an adversary who is coming in to buy. So we have launched that initiative, and that's run out of industrial policy, and that's uh, Jen Santos, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Um, the other thing is we are investing in our trusted foundries. For 20 plus years, we haven't looked at our industrial base. We, we are now turning around and saying, okay, and Congress is leaning in as well, and they're making some great investments to help get us strong again. Because when we look at some of the things in the supply chain, and we look at you know a, a manufacturer of a widget that only needs four widgets a year, and they get bought by another company from an adversary, and we can't get that in our supply chain, that's when we need these supply chain illumination tools to be able to highlight that so that our intel community, um, that our, our, our most expertise people that we can put in actually can get into the supply chain and help us at that time. But unless we have the data to support that, we, we use the supply chain illumination tools that were used in the MDA pilots, we're never going to get our arms around that. We don't know where to invest the money into a company that is critical in the supply chain um, in the right time in the right place if we don't have the data and the tools to support it. We don't have the right tool set right now to get the intel community when they see threat and, and to be use the predictive analysis to get in front of it. That's why we have to use these the data. The, the capability of technology to support us to thwart our adversaries in the supply chain. I, I, I can go on for hours. Sure. <laughs> actually, I was going to go back to the contract question, but then I can talk <laughs> about this one. No, so yes. I, I, I actually thought that, that was a good question because what we see from a, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, an industry perspective, and you know, I hate to say this, I probably spend more time with our contract community and lawyers than I do with our technical professionals only because we see a lot of cyber requirements coming in, well-intentioned to solve particular problems, but the conversion from a technical idea to contract language often tends to be problematic. I mean, from our perspective, what we'd like to see, you know, let's take an example of um, uh, sensors on, government sensors on industry networks, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, yeah, yeah, right, so everybody switches, right? I'm glad you so, raised that, yes. So we've seen so many variations of language, and we've worked with different services as to the legal challenges, but maybe ways to get at the root problem of what they're trying to solve, which is we need access to information to know if something bad's happening on your network. At times, they may need to be able to come in and help small to mid-sized suppliers. Right, so if you focus on the problem and say, okay, now how do we work together to come up with contract language? But I'd like to do that once and then share it across the different services to say, hey, look, you know, this worked for service X. If that's the problem you're trying to solve, rather than have your own contracting professionals try to write up the language, why don't we just use that like we do software reuse? Right, so I mean, so are there ways we can do stuff like that? And that's a, it's a really good example because we've seen probably three variations of, you know, we want to put sensors on your networks. And we're like, all right, well, really, what are you trying to do? And once you get down to the root of it, you can generally help solve the problem and you know, kind of bypass some of the legal considerations with actually you know, saying we're going to put a government censor on your network. I, I envy you spending so much time with attorneys. I couldn't think of anything more delightful to do. <laughs> so my only comment there is it's gratifying to hear about all the planning up front. Uh, we, at least historically or in the past, have sort of suffers the security apparatus for a failure to plan up front. 
So no one can deny that, um, that uh, the Americans and the acquisition communities built the best weapons mankind has ever known. Um, it's amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, over time, right, there is a compromised state much more recently. And uh, this is gratifying. And the reason is because quite often we, we're challenged with approving uh, processes um, um, and or facilities that may be a little more challenging. And they, they, uh, to say, in fact, they're really secure, um, uh, you're, you're, I won't say forgiving the security situation, but to ensure, in fact, the overall department's objectives are met. Sometimes we're having to um, compromise on some, uh, on some capabilities, and it's gratifying because that's where it needs to be fixed up front, at least from my perspective. So, so we're at INSA. So one of the major INSA mandates is thinking over the horizon as to what's happening in the intelligence world. So we have a question from the audience. How are we going to attract and retain the type of cyber talent that the government needs given what Lockheed Martin can pay and what the Valley can pay for that type of talent in comparison to what we can pay in the government. What's, Bob, what's the DHS solution to attracting and retaining key talent? You know, it, these are all not answered pithily. Um, the, the reality in my mind is there are plenty of people who will be happy to spend years doing things they can do to secure the nation and feel like they're doing that. So, so let's start with making sure that the professionals who are, who are doing that feel connected to how they're making a difference. You know, those are cultural elements there. I think even if you're talking from a pure financial perspective, you go look at who's making a lot of money in cybersecurity and you see a lot of people who spend a good amount of time in government. So, so you know, I think we need to have cultures that are put in place that aren't about bureaucracy but are about achieving security aims. We have to continue to evolve our processes, particularly around cyber professionals, where it's easier to come in and out and get different experiences and recognize that, you know, the way we're not going to, you know, at least from DHS, we're not going to have 30-year professionals in this stuff. We're going to have people who come in. We want to take advantage of expertise. We, we want to, we've been talking a lot about procurement in terms of procuring and making sure security is an important part of procurement, but also flexibility and agility in procurement is a key element so we can bring in talents when, when we don't have it there. And then continue to, you know, push for hiring reform processes where you recognize that people with cyber experience can come in quickly, can, can do a period, help secure the nation, feel like they're securing the nation, go do something else, and they may come, go back and forth, and that, that's an accepted part of the discipline. So, so that's kind of my five to ten year aim. I, I think overall, you know, then you have the, the broader workforce education development and the importance of getting people earlier in their careers and, and putting more money into the financial system so that there's more education out there. And I think you, you've seen that kind of progress, and we're going to just see that the, the, the you know, the number is going to be larger of people who have the skill set as we continue to go forward, but, but government's going to have to get more nimble to take advantage of that number. So DOD, there's a tremendous amount of initiatives from changing career fields and expanding career fields for active duty military personnel and actually making them more defined. That effort's been underway for the, the better part of two years. Um, culturally, um, you know, I, I'm going to agree with what Bob said. I'm an HQA. Um, the government has a highly qualified, qualified expert, expert, right? So I have a definitive timeline that I can work with in the Department of Defense. I can't take this position and continue on. It's, it says five years plus one, that's it, I'm done. Um, I think in the CISO position that is currently what I'm doing, I think those are more, you know, we would love to have um, the, the, the professional exchanges. We've done it with the acquisition community, but I think it's a really huge benefit. I mean, you look at what's happening in the DOD. We have Dana Deasy, who's our CIO, coming in from J.P. Morgan, to influx for a certain amount of time commercial experience into the DOD incentivizes us to do better and change our culture and, and how we're doing things. I think lessening the bureaucracy, I think that's a huge thing. People don't want to come to the government because of the bureaucracy, so we're working hard to, to bring that down. Um, the third thing is the capability of understanding that a four-year degree does not always equal the right person in the job. And we need to look at the fact that we're, we're starting to, to turn outwardly and looking at, instead of cramming everybody into, I think it's 2210, the, the, the category for IT networking, that is in cyber. 
And we need to expand that. There are efforts, uh, Pathfinder's underway uh, within the DOD. We see it culturally. We know we're making a huge change. But I'm going to go back to what this all came down to in the, you know, the first part of what I said in the very beginning is that no matter what we do unless we value security and those cybersecurity personnel, personnel and the capability that they bring, cost, schedule, and performance are virtually worthless unless we invest on the people that can create and, and cultivate security as a cultural shift. So I think we're moving mountains in DOD. Can we do better? Yes. Um, but look at, uh, you know, we're, more to come. So it's hard to imagine. We only have about five minutes left. The time has flown. So what I thought I might do is uh, just go down the row and give each panelist about a minute. That, and here's the two questions. One, if you could affect one critical thing in policy, what would you hang your hat on? And two, one of the questions that came forward was, we haven't mentioned the C word, the cloud. Mm -hmm. And is the cloud the solution for a variety of those small entrepreneurs and small businesses that being mandated to use a cloud might be a way of ratcheting up on scale security issues. So I give you those two last questions as we go down the row. I'll start with you, Bill. So my, uh, I guess from my perspective, I think that um, so the notion of deliver on compromise actually began in DCSA. And it was a clarion call and a conversation about, gosh, why is this not occurring? And uh, it eventually led to, uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this paper that, uh, that Mida wrote. And I would just propose that, uh, and I'll leave you, I, I, and I appreciate what Katie Arrington's working on in this. She actually even uses the words deliver and compromise. I do appreciate that because I'll tell you, uh, as a taxpayer, um, uh, I never, even when I came to this job, I could never imagine that that was not the objective um, of the, of the, when we were trying to purchase our capability or get our capability. I assumed that was the case until actually I had a conversation with uh, another government guy. He was lamenting his circumstance that they had a compromised capability and that's why we wondered why is, you mean, you mean a, we, no, that's not part of the requirement that we deliver an uncompromised capability. In fact, it wasn't. And it came to, it came, to uh, it came around again uh, when, in fact, the, the authors of this paper right here were in a conversation uh, with the newspaper reporter, and the newspaper reporter said, uh, "Well, exactly who's got to be told to deliver an uncompromised capability over there?" And they were referring to the department. Yeah, there's a lot of nuances associated with it, but I would just propose it is a pretty simple concept, and it's something that. Uh, uh, at least from my perspective, the one thing that I'm going to talk, uh, ask for essentially is I think that that notion collectively that we as a nation or we as a department pursue that and I think that's what we're stumbling toward and increasingly moving toward aggressively. So I hope that that in fact continues. Katie. So really quickly if I could be, what was it, the make one thing to hang my hat on? Yeah. Um, I'd like to reduce even if 10 percent are ex bills in my tenure and the capability. If I could reduce that by 10%, I will see myself as a total win. Um, without a doubt, you think of the amount of money that we're losing and why that matters. So you think about the men and women in uniform that are going to training and what happened 30 years ago when you went to basic and what happens now when you go to basic because our training dollars have been squashed. If I could keep our adversaries for taking 10% of our money and our data and put that back to training and education, we would be, it would put us in a much better place. So that's my hang my hat. Cloud, absolutely. So in the CMMC model, we have taken cloud into it. We actually incorporated FedRAMP, RMF, all of that into the model. Um, what we're looking to help small businesses and those micro businesses is cybersecurity as a service, and that includes cloud, that they can clip into their current um, aperture so that they can access the cloud in a secure manner so that they can meet their requirements. Because the last thing we want to do is keep small and, and, and micro businesses out of the Department of Defense. You are the baseline of a lot of innovation, and we need you. So absolutely, we see cloud as, as the next, you know, it's, it's here today, but how you get the cyber, the Cybersecurity as a service to provide the cloud is part of the CMMC. Great. Mike. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, I would say from a, from a policy perspective, I had mentioned to harmonize the different efforts, but specifically to the CMMC, I think we need to move towards a capability-based maturity model as opposed to a control-based model. And I know we provided that feedback, mm -hmm. and it's ongoing feedback we give, but checklists tend to be static. They're, they're, they're not dynamic. Our threat is dynamic. Mm -hmm. So if I think if you look more at capabilities and the maturity of those capabilities, it, it would inform us more in a company's ability to sustain their cyber defenses as opposed to, yep, this, you know, this year I can put my check marks and let's go to next year. Right. So I think that's the one thing. I think from a cloud perspective, um, you know, I'll, I guess I'll give you the lawyer answer, at least every answer I always get from a lawyer is it depends, right? I mean, we, we actually have yeah. a technical working group stood up <laughs> under the DIB Sector Coordinating Council Task Force. Cloud is one of the areas we're looking at. And the first thing they did was use cases. Because we do feel there are certain use cases within a multi-tier supply chain, cloud is a great fit. We think technologies like digital rights management are a good fit. So there's probably two, three game-changing technologies we can bring to bear to help different aspects of this problem, but they're use case dependent. There is no, hey, cloud is it, we're done, right? If that was the case, yeah. you know, we would have snapped our fingers, so. So we're gonna give DHS the last word, which often happens in the interagency process, as you know. Does it? Yeah. You've been in the interagency process for a while, huh? <laughs> um, so uh, on cloud, I don't have too much more to add. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, I tend to think innovation is, leads to better outcomes uh, along this. And here, you know, cloud does, as Scott was just interested in, there, there'll be new risk areas and there'll be new risk management opportunities. And it, it's key to recognize that. Um, I'm a fan of the sort of, I guess it's Dean Astridson, the, the president of the creation idea. And, you know, as I understand it from, you know, reading about the Wiseman and things like this. But we are present at the creation of the national effort to get in front of what is a new major, hopefully not existential challenge to, to us in our national security and is changing the nature of geopolitics. And so, you know, and I'm literally, and me and my colleagues are literally present at the creation of the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, which I'm very happy about. What, you know, I take to be different from the, the analogy of, of the 40s and 50s is, we're present at the creation of a new challenge and in, in, in just going after things, but we're, we're dealing with a bunch of things that are out, outdated systems, outdated yeah. rules, outdated laws around that. And my policy prescription, going back to the last question or the policy thing, we, we need to do whatever we can to break down things that will hurt the ability of government and industry because of the nature of the challenge, because of the nature of the tax base from working together and taking advantage um, from, from the ideas, industry, academia, et cetera. And I still think that the, 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 the rule set we're dealing with to deal with the challenge of cybersecurity isn't up to the challenge of cybersecurity as much as it can be. And, you know, there has to continue to be a, a push to adjust the rules set to deal with the 21st century challenge right. here. And, you know, I think there's that enthusiasm and you see that strategic moment, but we, we need to, that needs to be pushed through with particular policy imperatives that will allow us um, to all work together at this, at this challenge. Well, it's exactly 2.45. And um, the first announcement I want to make is who has a TSSCI clearance in the room? It's a trick question. Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. It's a trick question. You know, it's 101. Come on, guys. Trick question. But, but if you do have it, don't raise your hand. Uh, you can learn more about the challenges in greater detail at the INSA Summit Classified Day on September 12th. Um, and if you can register uh, uh, your organization at the INSA and Af uh, AFC Cossack uh, uh, kiosk. Let me just want to thank these people for their public service, excluding uh, the Lockheed Martin guy. So <laughs> we do. You're part of the team, as you know, Mike. But these people are toiling in the fields in a way that they're not thanked. They're giving up huge amounts of income. They're giving an amount, a great deal of aggravation doing the government's work and public service. So can you please join me in thanking them and INSA for putting together support and what they do. Uh, we're going to have the break for networking and uh, from 2.45 to 3.15. Please join us in the plenary session, the discussion on defense intelligence. Thank you so much.